for inviting me to come here. And I'm just having a really nice time walking around sailplanes, stuff that I like a lot. And, and I'm here today, as all said, to talk a little bit about Nixus. Uh, probably you guys heard about Nixus on the last Keep Planes magazine. Eric Stewart, he's he going to talk after that. He wrote an article about Nixus. And this month on the Sorry magazine, uh, there's another article about Nixus. And Nixus is the name for this sailplane we will talk about. But a lot of people ask me what the word means, and it's a Latin word that means pushing forward. And that was the idea, at least for me, you know. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what I did before. And, um, and this is like, talked a lot about my life on the last 20 years, exactly 20 years this year, I graduated in Brazil as aeronautical engineer. And my senior project was the design of this airplane. My, my mentor there, my professor, almost a father for me, uh, on my birthday one year, came to have lunch with me with a sport aviation magazine rolled up on his hair. He said, I have a gift for you, you can take a knot. I said, well, let's see what's the gift. And he opened the magazine, was November 1992, sport aviation, the AR-5, Mike Arnold's airplane. And he said, well, at the university level, we cannot build anything that's the fastest, the biggest, the strongest airplane in the world. But if we set up a category, like for those little teeny tiny airplanes, maybe we can. Do you want to try? I said, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> and I designed the airplane. Um, at the end of that year, 1999, he sent me to, to German to do an internship in Brauchwein at the Acker fleet there with uh, Army Quast. So if you guys know about uh, sailplane airfoils, back in the 80s and 90s, the, the, the best airfoil that you can get is the HQ, the Q is for Quast. And he actually born in Brazil before the war and went back to Germany. So he speak fluent Portuguese, super nice for me. And, and then I graduated in 1999. This professor told me, well, where are you going? And I said, well, uh, I'm going to get a job at Embraer. And he put his hand on his pocket and took, uh, at that time it was like a thousand bucks, you know. And he put over the table and he said, why you don't go build an airplane? So he bribed me to stay there <laughs> in my master thesis. And I took it and, and I built the airplane. It took 11 years for us to set the records. But in 2010, I managed to set uh, four word speed records with the FAI. It's funny that we saw the, the red glider, Earth Cup covert glider, that set the first American record, word record, after the, the, the Wright brothers. This airplane set the first Brazilian word record after Santos Dumont. That's the guy who flew in Paris around the airplane full tower. So uh, we set a three kilometers record, Mike Arnold's record. Hopefully Eric will break in a few years and I will go for it again. <laughs> and a hundred, uh, 15 kilometers, 100 kilometers and time to climb. Okay? Within those 11 years, I built this airplane in Brazil. Great inspiration from Dan with the one design I said, because in my life I always have that thing, you know, Someone knows how to do it, but I don't know, and I want to know. And the only way that I learn something is doing it. So I said, I want to design an aerobatic airplane. And I went to the same or similar road that Dan went with the four-cylinder engine. I said, I want to take the maximum that I can get out of a four-cylinder airplane. Because fuel, especially heavy gas in Brazil, is expensive. So if I could make a limited aerobatic airplane out of a four-cylinder and give to a Brazilian pilot, my dream was I can make a world champion because he's going to be able to train twice as more, as much, as he can train with the six-cylinder. So that was a good target. We never made the, the world championship. He was Brazilian champion with this airplane, but it was a huge learning experience for me to identify that uh, the difference between 6 G's and 11 G's is not only 5 G's. <laughs> On those 5 G's there is a lot there. So we broke a lot of stuff. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, August 5th, the airplane 
celebrate his 10th anniversary, still flying. For me, it's, it's a good thing. And then the last one was the Anakin. Probably you guys saw a lot about Anakin on the magazines here in the US. But after this airplane set the world record, then I got into a depression. I was like, what, what, what are I going to do now? I need to do something. And, and I decided to do another race airplane. And, and my life is keeping doing this. Every time that I finish the airplane, I got to this depression, and I want to do another one. It's a most maniac, maniac de depressive, you know? <laughs> when you're doing it, it's super excited, let's do it. No, sorry. When you're doing it, it's depressing, because you're like, why the heck I'm doing this? <laughs> and you finish, you got the, the maniac, and let's do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> and I'm on this cycle so far. So, Anakin, the idea was to break uh, John Sharp's nemesis, the Formula One nemesis record. I cheat a little bit, but John was cheating a little bit as well, so it's fair. Uh, it's not a Formula One airplane, and it's not a old 200. So it has a big engine, it's a small wing. So it's easy to go faster. We went 100 kilometers per hour faster than John. Um, we set the 5, 15, 100, 500, and time to climb to 3,000 meters. That was a really difficult record to break. Belongs to, at that time, to Bruce Bohannon with the push collar. There is a picture of me at Reno with Bruce on my neck. <laughs> but it was a great experience. The important of all of this is, are not the airplanes. The important of all of this is that all those airplanes were built, designed, built, and operated with students. I was a student designing this one. I finished this one as the professor teaching students how to design. But I was in Brazil, and guys, in Brazil, it's not as easy as here. I'm telling you, it's hard. Just imagine to put an engine there, if I want to import an engine there, it's 60% of tax. And I was the best friend of the corporate jet pilots in Brazil, the best <laughs> friend. <laughs> All the airplanes coming full of parts for me. And, but do this with students is great because it's not only that they are learning how to do it, they are putting their hands on, but they're doing the fastest airplane in the world. When they go work for Embraer, they really believe they are the best ones in the world. Maybe they are not, but you know, that, that impulse is there. And they are ready to fight with everyone. So this was 15 years of, yeah, 15, 16 years of my life doing this. And then after Anakin, I was invited to come to US and I was looking for a, a, a break. And I came with the intention to do a second project, and, or a, th a fourth project, sorry. And the fourth project is this guy here that you guys know as Nixus. So this gentleman in Brazil, of course, really wealthy, uh, said, I want you to design and build an airplane for me. I said, no, I don't want Because the Germans are so far ahead of us, or at least for me, that if I want to replicate what they do, I'm going to be behind them. And he said, no, no, come fly with me. And he has a Ash study in Brazil. I went to fly with him. It was my first time on an open class airplane. And the flat thing was amazing. I never had fly airplane. I mean, the 50 to 1 is amazing. You look outside and you're level. And you, where's the engine? But you're flying level. That was amazing. But the flat was pretty cool. On the first hour, you know all that. <laughs> it was awesome. After the first hour, it was a pain flat. And I said, Surgeon, this is what we, I want to do. I want to build a fly-by-wire wing. And at that time, it, was, it looked like a good challenge for me. I was like, I, I want to learn how to do it. So let's learn how to do it. And the other thing that I told him, I want an aspect ratio more than 50. Ooh. Just because it's, you know, how many people I build a more than 50 aspect ratio in the world? Well, I want to be one of those. And I knew that the challenge would, would come. But that was a good challenge for me. Okay? And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. And uh, just to give you some numbers, that's Nixus compared with a lot of open class airplanes. The, the gray bars are single seaters, the green bars are two seaters. So wing air, sorry, is in square meters. But uh, square meters, you multiply by 20, and it's uh, square foot. Is no. that right? No. Multiply by 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. Okay, thank you, Eric. And, and so you can see Nixus is one of the smallest 
uh, wing areas for two seaters. Um, aspect ratio, only Concordia has a bigger aspect ratio than the number that we choose. And of course, to get to those numbers, there is a lot of analysis thinking about thermal models and what, what, we, what we want with the sailplane. And since day one, the target was this is not a competition sailplane. This is a world record sailplane. <coughs> the day that the weather is bad, we go to the bar. The day that the weather is good, we go fly. The weather is not good, we're not flying. Okay? And that's why wing loading <coughs> reaching 67 kilograms per square meter. It, it can be the, the heaviest one flying around. Okay? So all of this is only possible, and my whole career was only possible because I use the metaphor of standing on giant shoulders. I always did that. I was talking with them today that I got a job at Cal Poly. The first thing that I did was to ask who are the old professors who taught here. I want to listen from them what they think, what they expect. And it was not different with Nixus. So we went around the world to find good people to be with us. And Sergio, is the owner of the project, his guy is sponsoring everything, he's a sailplane uh, uh, pilot in Brazil, has several records in Brazil, and of course he's important because he's paying the bills, but there is a lot more on that. It's nice to have a guy paying the bills that understand the problem, and understand the challenge, and have pleasure with the challenge. It's not just about see the whole thing ready but it's about to see the development of that. So uh, I'm really happy to have him as a sponsor of this project. He told me since day one, I want aerodynamics to, to verify your work. <coughs> and we contact few aer sailplane aerodynamics around the world. And at the end, luckily, we went to Luke Borsman uh, in, in the Netherlands. And Luke is the one designed most of the Air Force today. And he did a huge contribution that I will talk a little bit about for the airfoil and, and for the aerodynamic design of the wing. Then I met Dijkfin Gengsis. I don't know who no guy Dijkfin here. Dijkfin worked for Lockheed, Boeing. Um, he was on the, when they put the space shuttle on the 747, he was the guy who designed those strakes on the horizontal tail of the 747. Um, and I have a friend in Brazil that knew that I was doing this and a project and went to a restaurant where Embraer is. And he met Dakfin there and they had worked together in Embraer before. And he said, oh, I have a friend that's doing a sailplane fly-by-wire project. And Dakfin is a sailplane pilot and he has a house in Minden. And Dakfin is one of the nice word experts in fly-by-wire. He's doing all the Embraer fly-by-wire. And I said, I want to be part of this. So I contact Dr. and say, I want, a, I want a person to help me. Are you in or not? He said, I'm in. And so Dr. gave me all the assistance with the flyball wire design. And then Dr. introduced me to Jim. And Jim, of course, you guys know Jim. Uh, he was at 55,000 feet today. I don't know if you guys follow that, but no lift today again in Argentina. And, and Jim, I went to visit Jim in Minden one time. He came visiting Jackson, California, where I was building, and, and he was in. He was in since day one. And it's been such a pleasure to work with him on this project. He brought so much, so much experience, and, and the way that he approached the flight is just amazing for me. So without those people and many others, I mean, Eric is sitting there, went to work with me many, many times doing layups. Craig Cato is the guy who gave me the space to work first. There's a lot of people in San Luis Obispo, it was impossible to do a project like that. So a little bit of what I'm gonna talk today. Questions that I would not answer, okay? The first one is why we're doing this. <laughs> Actually, this one I can't answer. And to answer that one, I use, I'm gonna use what Edmund Hillary said. You know who, who is Edmund Hillary? Yeah. The gentleman, the first, of, uh, first guy to enter Everest. And they asked him, why are you climbing the Everest? And he answered, why is it? It's there. So the Nix is the same thing. It makes sense, 
like all said, it's done. It is totally done to build such a big sail plane. It's painful to operate it. <clears throat> but I want to do it, and the owner wants to do it, and there's a lot of learning experience on that, and look, hopefully, I'm going to be able to transmit this at Cal Poly or whatever university I will be teaching. Okay, but don't ask much why we're doing that. How much it costs? Don't make that question. Okay, it's not more than two open class airplanes, but it's more than one. Let's put it like that. What's the maximum LOD? Well, at that point, sorry about my my. My analogy here, but if the pilot forks inside the cockpit, they change the LVD. <laughs> okay, so so far all my predictions are just numbers. We didn't have a chance to measure it properly, and at this point, it's such a small thing makes such a big difference that I need to be sure we make sure the airplane is totally ready, and it's not. It only has 20 hours of operation. We still struggle with some stuff, so. I have one point of performance, I will show it later, but don't ask me about the maximum, I don't know. Okay? Of course, expectations are huge, but we don't know. Things that I want to talk about is the airfoil design, that's what, one big step on this project. The design of the structure, that's probably the major step of this. Um, how the flyby wire works, I'm going to try to be really simple on that, because it is really simple. Uh, how we build it, and how it flies. Okay? <laughs> So the airfoil design, um, the airfoil design is the first time in history that the DU airfoils, Delft Universe airfoils, receive another name, the PI, that's Pauli School. And I'm really, really, um, what's the word? Honor. Make honor with that. It, it, it was such a, a great pleasure to work with Luke Wardsman. I learned so much. And that's a little bit of what I want to bring in here. Okay, how we design air force. There is a lot of steps. There is a lot of steps that it looks intellectual property, so I don't want to give too much details about that. Uh, but I can, I talked with him about this before. We, we told him if you want to join the project, we want to, to make this public. We, this is why we're doing Nixons, is to, to, to make this information available. Because on the last 20 years, the sailplane industry is hiding everything. And to be really honest, I hate it. Because I, I learned how I learned how to love sailplanes with Jig Johnson and the soaring magazine and the technical soaring. And twenty years ago they were really nice. On the last twenty years they're going downhill. Okay? So one of the reasons that we do Nix is because we want to make this public. Maybe not yet because we're still developing, there is a lot of uncertainty, but when we are sure that it works, we want to make it public. Okay. So the first step is the X-foil calibration. So yes, we did use X-foil. Okay. The tricky part of using X-foil to design air, those airfoils is what Luke is doing and uh, Professor Kubrinsky, the guy who designed Diana 2, does. And I took this from a paper that he published, is the calibration of X-foil. Okay. I can give you some tricks. If you want to do that, use the latest version of X-Foil, 6.94, I believe. Because there are some new parameters there. There were not there before. You had to do that by hand, programming on Fortran. The new one has. The second trick is don't look for articles about sailplane design. Look for articles about wind turbine design in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And all the information is there. OK? But really, the trick is for each Reynolds number, for each flap set up, there is a combination of boundary layer parameters that maps the wind tunnel really well. And they know those parameters. Okay? So that's then, then the X-Foil can be a good tool to design the Air Force. I want to talk a little bit about the Air Force. I don't want to go too much into the details right now because we have limited time, but just what's the difference between the old, the old modern Air Force and the new modern Air Force, if we can say like that. So this is HQ-17, ASW, ASH-25, DG-800, all those airplanes use this Air Foil, okay? Late 80s, 
uh, early 90s. The airfoil was designed with flat zero. And at flat zero, the pressure recover was set to be linear. Okay, that was the design philosophy behind this airfoil. Then, the airfoil could operate with negative flat, which will make the pressure recover uh, con concave, so doing this curve, and will create a, 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 a positive gradient right at the, at the hinge point with a really shallow uh, pressure recover at the flat. And that what was, so this pressure recover concave is really tricky for separation. But as soon as the flow was about to separate, it hits this bump that I'm trying to explain the easiest way possible, okay? no technical at all. But this bump kind of prevents the separation. And then the, that really less inches on the airfoil, the slope of the, the pressure recovery was really shallow. The flow was able to keep it <coughs> attached. The problem was when you start to deflect the flaps positive. Because when you deflect the flap positive, that lift slope becomes really steep. And then the separation happens. Okay? And, and they start to push this type of design. And then Borsman come with this new philosophy. He said, well, if the problem is the flaps down, let's design the airfoil for flaps down. So you put the new airfoil flaps down, and for this airfoil, the pressure recover is set to be linear. So we force it to be linear, okay? Or as linear as possible. Then when you bring the flaps up, then you have this really concave pressure recover, okay? But if it's well designed, this, this, the kink will prevent the separation and the flap will be okay with almost no pressure gradient. The trick of doing this is that when you increase angle of attack, the transition point at the upper surface has a tendency to move forward really quick, close to the stall. And I can show you on this diagram. So in this diagram I have pressure uh, distribution from minus 2 to plus 3 degrees and you can see minus 2, minus 1 and 0 the transition is around 70% of the core and then when you go 1 the transition jumps to 0.6 oh, wow. 2, 55, 3, 40% so this really quick movement of the transition makes you, if you want to not have separation the gradient here needs to, to become shallow. So you lose this lift. If you don't compensate this lose of lift with your, le your leading edge, what's going to happen is this with your lift slope. Is this what they call the lift plateau. Okay? You start to, especially with flaps, you start to increase the angle of attack. The airfoil stalls. But it recovers again because this first stall is the movement of the transition and the recovery is because the leading edge is picking up pressure and then it stalls again. So there is a sailplane that's well known to have this behavior, that's the GG400. And it has this kind of smooshy stall. So you get close to the stall and the airplane you feel that it will stall, you can either recover, but then your speed will be pretty high. If you pull more angle of attack, then the airplane will fly again. So to land the DG400, the trick is when you're gonna flare, flare for sure, put the nose up, to jump this part and bring it here. The problem is when you fly thermals, because when you fly thermals, you fly here, you don't want to fly here, really high CL, but you want to fly minimum sink. It's pretty close to maximum CL, but it's not there. So you're on the vicinity of this phenomenon all the time. 
in the airplane just fly like a duck. <laughs> okay? So the big contribution that Borsman, so Borsman is the guy who lived in those Air Force and could explain this really well. And he came with ideas to design this upper surface to avoid this plateau. This is an example of one of the Nixus um, Air Force. That's the one that's at the root. Not really at the root, because the root we have the tur turbulent Air Force, but like a foot from the root. And you can see, you still have the plateau, but the slope is always positive. And that makes a huge difference. Uh, I don't have numbers to prove it makes a difference, but it's a sailplane that takes off with 12 pounds per square foot of uh, wing loading. And when everybody's coming down, Nix is still flying. Okay, so it does climb pretty well, even with that wing loading. So here is the family of airfoils, including uh, wing laps airfoils, and I believe 11. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 Air Force. So those two that has the maximum thickness really uh, close to the leading edge are the transition Air Force that goes from the root of the wing intersecting with fuselage to about a foot off. It's a region that uh, it's almost impossible to have laminar flow all the time, so it's better to just design that region with a turbulent Air Force. <coughs> and then after that, we go to the VUPI 17. It starts at 13 and a half percent of thickness and finishes with uh, 12 and a half percent. So it's not only a 53 aspect ratio wing; it's only 13 and a half percent thick, and it's a two-seater. So maximum lift, a uh, non-lifting weight is 500 kilograms. Uh, then you can imagine the spores that he needs. Yeah. It's like trees. <laughs> okay? And then transition to the to this red one, that's the winglet airfoil. It's a single airfoil winglet. The winglet, we have it right now, but probably we're going to get rid of the winglet. Because if we want to go fly fast, we don't want the winglet. So the, they are there because they look cool. That's the reality. <laughs> okay, another picture that you guys can see the airfoil. Uh, one, one thing on Nixus that's different from modern sailplanes is the size of the miler. And we went really aggressive with the miler. So when Rex first saw the airplane, he's like, oh, those milers will not work because they are long milers. So far, so good. I don't know how long they're going to last, but um, that's what allows us to have such nice, especially on the upper surface, nice curvature when flaps are down. Okay. So after the so Borsman also did a lot of contribution with the the wing plan form, and but I will cover the wing plan form on the structural design because there is a there is a there is a correlation between wing plan form and structural design that's really important for us. Okay. The problem with the 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 structural design of Nix is is, is the way, the aspect relation. 53 is not a, a, a toy anymore. It's not like my race airplanes anymore. And one of the first problems that we have is that you need to treat the wing all the time as a flex spoke structure. So I can't calculate loads on a straight wing anymore because my wings deflect so much that I need to calculate loads on my deflected wing. But what's the shape of the deflected wing? Well, it really depends on the load. Yeah. So the first step was to create a, a computer software to do this. It's not complicated at all. It's just a, a, a it's actually a, a, a lifting line. I'm saying vortex flats here, but it's not true. It's a lifting line method. The only difference is nonlinear, so I get airfoil data instead of just a lift slope. And it's elastic. So there is a structural model running all the time of it and gives me the deflection of the wing. Okay, so that was step number one. This allowed me to calculate all the moments, bending moment, torsion, shear diagrams, and everything. But the software that we wrote does another thing that's really interesting for us. That's the automatic generation of the phi model, the finite limit model. This is speed up the process really well, and it's easy for us to create 
different configurations for the wing. The colors that you see here are a different number of layers, and for us to create all those different numbers of layers, it's just a matter to create a, a little matrix, and it creates that for me. So it was easy, using this software, easy to, to optimize the wing. And this is a typical result of what we have. Um, that's a 5.3 G, so 6.1 meters of deflection, 18 feet. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And the magic number here is failure index. It's a combination of stress and strain on the composites that tells me if the composite will fail or not. Okay, I will talk a little bit more about that. But, so, the problem that we want to solve here, well, at the end, it's gonna be flutter. That's the main question, okay? But before I get to the flutter, I want to guarantee that the performance of the sailplane will be the same no matter the condition that the sailplane is flying. And those airfoils I showed before, one degree can be a lot. But now my wing is deflecting a lot. How much bending deflection is being converted in twist deflection? And when your flaps come down, how much your wing twists? So that is the first problem that I want to solve, okay? So Luke Borsman, uh, Johan Dillinger, Gerhard Weibel, and Dick Butler, they solved that problem for the Concordia. And did, uh, Johannes is the student that did the job. <coughs> and what Johannes did was tailor the angles of the fiber on the skin, okay? I tried to do the same. And we actually, this is torsion, this is wingspan. The green line is the twist of the wing at 1G flight. So if I adjust that angle of my fibers over the span, I can get almost 0 0.1 degrees. The, it, the number is not really important because there is a twist that happens at the root just because of the, the way that the wing is fixed at the fuselage. But it's really constant, so it means if I design my wing with that twist, it's fine. What's interesting is, for that solution, look what happens when I pull G. When I pull 5.3 Gs, now my wing twists one and a half degrees, which is way too much for me. That's a positive twist too, right? And it's positive. Yeah, yeah if you look it's carefully, that's really bad for divergence. Yeah. yeah. So then I said, no, I don't want to go that direction because that will kill my flutter later. Yeah. And the flutter is something, at least for me, with my one person engineer, I design the whole thing hoping that flutter will be okay. And then I calculate flutter. I don't design for flutter. Right. Flutter is a consequence of my design. So I need to do as much as I can before to guarantee that flutter will be okay when I do my flutter analysis, GBT, or whatever. But I need to take care of this now. And I said, no, I don't go with this solution. So the sailplane will need a little bit of forward sweat anyway, because it's a two-seater. That will make that even worse. The solution that I come with, and I'm not here defending that this is the best solution in the world at all. I'm just trying, okay? I'm learning. But since I have the forward sweat, sweat I play with the position of the spar. So the top, the, 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 this is how the wing started, this, this is how the wing was built. And here is just a compressed view, so you can see what's going on. As you can see, this one, the wing, the spar, is everywhere on the maximum thickness. Because that's yeah, it's maximum available inertia. But what happens is, this wing wants to twist up. If I move the spore forward, I kill that. And, and of course, up to where I have huge problems of strength, I keep the spore where it is, maximum thickness. And it's really after that that I need to set the spore forward. And the solution is the two blue lines. I don't have zero twist all the time. 
But no matter the load factor that I pull, it's almost the same. Therefore, I can build my wing with this twist. And when I go fly, my air force are all aligned. It's a beautiful theory, huh? That's <laughs> <something that's laughs> I, don't I don't know if it's working or not. We need to put the M200s inside the wing and measure that. That's the way to measure this. We can do that. Yeah. Next, next step. Okay, materials. Materials is another important thing. And when Sergio told me that uh, we want to do the sailplane, I told him we need to go to US. There is no way that we can do this outside the US. And the reason was materials. So Nixus used the best commercial, one of the best commercial available fibers in the world. And you cannot buy, especially this one, outside US. Okay? Uh, so for the spark caps, we use IM2C. The intention was to use IM7, but we ended up using IM2C. It's a high strength fiber. So I got 40% more than what we buy at Craft Spruce, just as a reference. That's the AS4. And 30% more modulus, more stiffness. And for the skin, and, and all the spore caps were pre preg and I will show you, I, I built an autoclave to build the wing, believe it or not. And for the skin, it's our wet layup, and it's HM63, which is a high modulus fiber. So it's really brittle, you need to be really careful working with it, but it's 90% more modulus, with pretty much the same strength, okay? For the skin, we use non-crimped fabrics, and that was really interesting. The fibers were manufactured in Utah, were sent to England, in Cambridge to a Hexel factory in Cambridge to make the fibers and come back to US. It's just funny because you know guys all mentioned I worked for the Red Wear race for a British pilot called Paul von Hom and on his backyard there's a carbon fiber factory. <laughs> it's where the carbon fiber went. <laughs> yeah, super funny. And another important of all this process is the, the material characterization. So we did a lot of coupon tests. I was lucky enough to, to be working on the X57 project. So I did the structural design of the X57 wing. And when I got to that project, they told me, you choose the material. I'm going to use the same one that I'm using for Nixus. <laughs> and so we did a lot of characterization with the X57 and Nixus made use of that. It's public information. It's public on the NIAR website. You can go there and take a look for those materials. Uh, but that's really important for us because it helps to put confidence on the structural model of the wing. Okay, this is structural design, a little overview of the structural design. Um, you guys probably know, I think, you mentioned on your article about the wing breaking? I don't think you mentioned on your article, but I think it's on the, on the soaring article we mentioned that. We did the structural test, I will show a picture of the structural test. Um, the wing took the load, was great. I was on a ladder. I don't, so I, I gotta show a picture. Let me show well, a picture. the break is in the article. Is in the article? Yeah. yeah, let me just show it. So this is the wing yeah. structural test, I will talk about it. But I was on the top of the ladder, just put a measuring tape there to measure the deflection, and I have the owner of the project on the phone with me and said, it was great! And boom! Yeah. <laughs> it broke on the, on the, on the, the junction here. A stupid mistake, <laughs> as any mistake. Uh, I did the, so the, the spores, just a quick explanation why it broke. So this is the junction, is a fork on the inboard panel and a boom on the outboard panel. So the fork, there are four shear webs. One, two, three, four. So the block that takes the pin load and turns it to the shear web can be a certain size. On the other side is a boom. There's only two shear webs, so the block can be longer. I knew that. I designed correctly. But then I sit down on SolidWorks to do my CAD drawings, and you know it was so easy to draw the first, draw the first one. <laughs> and I just copy and paste that. Sure. I just copy and paste, and I build it like that. Oops. So it broke. Uh, I managed to. I, I, I cut the skin out of the inboard panel and I rebuilt this area and I had to rebuild the whole outboard panel. Today I was talking with Martin about the loss on this project. Luckily, 
This pen weighs 130 kilograms. This one weighs 30 kilograms. The price of a wing is proportional to the yeah, weight materials. because it's carbon fiber, it's material. So the whole wing weighs 600 kilograms. I lost 30 kilograms. You can calculate 20% of a loss. So the owner was okay to build again. But I had this hiccup on my structural design. Great learning experience and learned that uh, you saw I had a fly-by-wire guy oversee my project. I have an aerodynamics guy. I didn't have a structural guy. I should have one um, to do revision or manufacturing. Well, manufacturing we will not catch because it was the drawings were. It was manufactured for drawings, but not the drawings were wrong. Um, structural test. It's so nice when it breaks on the ground. <laughs> Super nice. So Jim, Jim Payne was there, and Jim said, there's no problem for me. I mean, that's the reason that we do this. I'm happy that it happened here, but we're going to do it again. So when you fix, we're going to do it again. How much and weight was on that outward section when it broke? Yeah. How much was it? A thousand pounds of water out there? Well, you, you can think about, I don't remember the number like that, but it's five, nine hundred, four fifty. It's, I would say it's one and a half tons per wing. The tip is probably 500 kilograms, 1,000 pounds. It's, yeah, it's a lot. But I will show you the, the structural test was a nice setup that prevent the wing to damage more. And I will show why. Okay, then we come to the, I need to speed up a little bit here. Uh, flyby wire. So why do the flyby wire sailplane wing? What a stupid idea. <laughs> it is, but why not? I want to learn something, and why not? I must tell you, it's so nice to read the ailerons and the flap systems and nexus, because it's a matrix. You just say, I want 24 and a half degrees on this aileron. And I just put a number there, and it goes 24 and a half now. So for that, it's really good, okay? But the point to do fly-by-wire was to come with the automatic flap. That was the first one. So I actually, I built an automatic flap for the IH-30, Surgeon's IH-30 in Brazil, and it works great. The flap, the way that most of the pilots fly the flap today is based on speed. So I'm in this speed, I fly this flap. Oh well, the flap should not be flown by speed should be flown by angle of attack or lift coefficient. So the way for the pilot to do that is to process on his brain and butt at the same time, G and speed. But that is not natural at all. For instance, if you're dolphin, you pull up. When you pull up, you're super fast. You need to apply flaps. You're fast, but you're putting Gs. So you go high angle of attack, you should apply flaps. On the top, when you pull, push down, you know push and pull in Portuguese is the opposite, so I guess. <laughs> push down, you're super slow, but you should retract the flaps, because you find almost zero lift coefficient. And then when you bring the load factor one again, then you bring the flap again. That's not natural at all. I'm 100% sure there are pilots flying like that, but it's not a majority. And it's easy to do that on the first hour. Do that and do all the decisions, and, and, and after a few hours flying, it's painful. Okay? So we decided to go fly by wire. There is a lot of stuff that we can do with fly by wire that hopefully Nixus will st still fly for more people to come to work and try to do it. Um, so it's a 28 meter span. When you're turning terminally, that speed is different from this speed. Mm -hmm. I can improve that a little bit. When I apply ailerons to roll, that's induced a drag. What's the best aileron deflection that I can have to minimize induced a drag during the roll? I can do that with fly by wire. Uh, Sergio is on a wheelchair. So his legs are kind of weak, had a scuba dive accident. 
So for him to overcome the adversarial is hard. But for Nixus, I can take all the adversarial out. So there's a lot of possibilities that we can explore. But really, the, pro the problem for us was to have a wing with appropriate aerodynamics, so high performance aerodynamics, appropriate structural design, be able to fly fast, equipped with actuators, with a reasonable amount of sensors that will allow us future developments. That's the goal for this project. So right now, we're working here, here, and here. Softer is something that can come later, and we can make as complicated as we want. Okay? But for now, it's just optimum flap deflections and improving handling qualities. This is the architecture of the, the system. And I'm going to go through this really quick, just to give you an idea how it works. But basically, we have three computers that are not really computers, are microcontrollers. So there is no operational system running. So this is real time, for sure. Okay? Those controllers, they have sensors that are unique for each one but they also talk with some common sensors. So for instance, pitot tube, I have three. I don't have actually three pitot tubes, but we only have two, but I have three sensors for pitot tube. So I can connect those pitot tubes either on the tail or on the nose. But inertial measurement unit, I only have one that I can have. Okay? Then I have a triple bus running inside the wing. Why triple bus? Because one of the most important failure points that I can have is connectors. Just one connector break, it doesn't work anymore. If I have three, the probability is way less. Okay, the controllers talk with the bus, the triple bus, each one on, on, on one bus. <coughs> Actually, my arrows are wrong here. This should talk with this bus, this should talk with this bus, this should talk with this bus. Okay? And this bus just run over the wing. Inside the wing, I have servos. And on top of each server, I have another microcontroller. That's why I call it node. What the node does? The node keeps talking with the server at high frequency, as fast as it can. Okay? So the node is intelligent, has the ability to talk with the controller. That's why I call it intelligent. And it knows if the server is alive. If the server is not alive, for any reason, the node will tell the controller, hey, I have a problem here. And that happens really fast. Okay? Approximately 200 hertz. The node also does a voltation, a voting system, with the information that comes with the three buses. So I hit you three information, they should be the same. And they are asynchronous. So they're not coming on the same time. So it needs to deal with that. But it, they should be the same. If they're not the same, if one is wrong, he can take this one out and use the two. If all the three are different, he said, oh, I'm, I'm in trouble. And he answers back to the controller saying, I don't know what to do. Okay? This is architecture allows me to do stuff like this. Okay? I, I, will, I will propose some failures here. There are many cases of failures that we analyze. I will talk about two failures. One failure. Oh, one more thing that I need to say before this. Each servo has independent power, but the power is combined with both sides. So servo one on the left wing is on the same circuit break of servo one on the right wing. So if you switch on servo one, both sides switch on at the same time. The wing has six flaps. And the most outboard one has a mixing system. It's the only one that still have the mechanical actuator. I'm stupid, but not that much. <laughs> Just a little bit. So I still have one mechanical aileron. It's on a mixer. So that aileron also has a servo. The mixer, I can talk a little bit about the mixer. It's a little bit trick. Because what happens if the servo comes out? The mixer will get loose. So the mixer sits on a spring that is good up to 180 kilometers per hour. After 180 kilometers per hour, that aileron will start to move with the, 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 hinge, the, the pressure of the air. Okay? But we are at test. If you set off all the flyby wire, you still have one third of your roll rate, which can be 
take you home really easy. And there is no reason to fly at 180 kilometers per hour. Okay? But, so let's imagine some failure case here. Imagine that server number one on this week stopped to talk with this node. Okay? They are both on the same power. Okay? So if they stop to talk, but this server is still alive, it means that probably the communication was lost. Because this guy still have power. Probably communication lost. Communication is lost means that this server is stuck on a certain position. What was the last position that that server was stuck? What is the last position that I know about the server? So the node knows this. Send the information back to all the controllers. All the controllers know that. Send the information to this side and send this server to the same position. However, the control has two components, flap and aileron. When the controller sends this server to the same position, it's just flat. The aileron would not work on this one, but I keep aileron work on this side because if they are asymmetrical, I still can't fight with my aileron. Okay? Imagine now that I lose communication with the node. So I don't know where, where this guy is anymore. Well, it could be a failure on this communication, but it's a triple bus, so the probability of that happens is less. So probably what happens is I lose power. Since I lose power on the node, I lose power on the server as well, probably. Everything is probability. We're never sure what happens. That's the problem. But if I lose power on the server, this server is now floating. And we calculate the hinge moments, the, the the hinge moment to make the, the flat float, change the angle, happens on a speed before the stall speed. Because, you know, the server has some friction. So you need some speed to make that, that, that flat move. But that is below stall speed. So for sure, this server, for sure, yes, can be on aviation. Uh, there's a big probability that this server is floating. So if this server is floating, the best thing that I can do to the other side is put that server on the floating angle for that speed. So then the computer does that thing. So this is the strategy that's behind all of this. It's, we can't stay here the whole day going failure cases <laughs> and, and how we are handling that. But that's the mentality of doing this. Okay? Right now, the whole flywheel I think is just a way to connect your stick to your flaps. We do have the automatic system working, works great, but we are not going too crazy with software and strategies yet. We want to get confidence and, and do more stuff. The servo is connected to the actuator that moves? The servo is connected straight to the, to the control surface. There's just one link. And is the speed of that sufficient to yes. change? Yes. How much torque does a servo like that have to be able to produce? Uh, eight decanewtons per. Oh well, yeah. I, I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it's um, so each surface has two servos, but they can survive with one servo only. The reason that we use two servos for redundancy, redundance, and to reduce the current on the system, we reduce temperature because temperature is what kills the servos. So if you keep everything cold, your chances are good. But they're they are pretty strong. I was going to ask, are your servo sized to operate at stall for extended periods or not? Oh, yeah. So you got just the current limit and take yeah. care of that? Yeah. OK, good. Yeah. good. The servo is actually this guy here. Uh, I contact a lot of companies uh, that does UAV servos. And, and I hate them because yes. you yes. call them and they ask, how much money you have? <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to do business like this. How many so I give up talking with them. And a, a colleague from Brazil told me about this yeah. robotic service. They're producing South Korea with the Maxon Motors. And I had a lot of experience with Maxon Motors. They're producing in Switzerland. They are really, really good. So I bought some service. And I, I put a, a rig together just with weight and I put the server to work for 2,000 hours. 
and the server was alive all 2,000 hours straight. What voltage do you run the server? 12, 12 volts. 12 volts? 12 volts. Yeah. Yeah. Are the servers separate motors or? No, they're not. They're Just DC, DC yeah. motors with a high effect sensor to, to, to position, position to, to close the loop. What sort of backlash do you have in the gear frame? Uh, th so after the 2,000 hours, I could measure some backlash, but not more than you have in a normal glider. Really? And I realized 2,000 hours is a good TBO for, for yeah. a glider anyway, so. You'll, you'll get limit cycling. Yeah. With the back yeah. I mean, the, the servos, when I put the rig, he, he was doing 25% dirt cycle all the time, mm -hmm. uh, plus or minus 60 degrees. But he went 2,000 hours straight with, without stop. And the only thing that happened was backlash. Then I disassemble, I try to you know, investigate if there is any weak link <coughs> there. And there are some. That's the reason that we have two servos. Uh, it's important to mention they're synchronized by torque, they're not synchronized by position, so they don't fight each other. Um, yeah, the service, to be honest, is, and they are intelligent, so it's not like an RC model server that you just send a PWM signal. Those are on a bus, and I can talk with them, they talk back with me, and I have information about torque, voltage, temperature, um, I have everything on the server. I can control speed, position, acceleration, so there's a lot that you can play with that. What's the brand? It's Dy Dy Dynamexo, Dynamexo, yeah, MX106R. <laughs> <laughs> so those not underneath the aileron or underneath the wing, just bolt on? Yeah, it's like an inspection cover underneath the wing. So they quick change? Relatively. <laughs> Can you see here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The covers. And on the covers, the first version, this is first version, I put some NACA duct. So the NACA duct is kind of in this area. And then I have a baffle inside the cover and I exit on the back. So the air had to go in, recirculate through the motor and come out. So the first 20 hours we did a lot of testing with temperatures. Temperatures were just fine. Uh, one problem with the aluminum covers, well, one problem is the aluminum covers on carbon fiber, so I had to put glass there. But even with the glass, there is electric connection. And if one servo touches the, something touches the one case, can short circuit the whole thing. So uh, I decided to take all the aluminum covers out, and we have plastic covers that we're testing now. And with the plastic, of course, how long they're going to last is the question. We keep our eyes on that. But now at least they are completely isolated. Uh, this is the node. It's uh, the same chip that's on uh, Arduino Mag is the AT Mega 2560, I believe. We just redesigned the whole thing around it. And it pretty much what it has is the four bus. There is another four, two on the bottom. But it's really simple. Um, and yeah, it's nice to build a flyby wire airplane because you don't need to do all the rods and you know bearings <laughs> anymore but yeah good luck with those guys <laughs> another fabrication let's go fast here I'm completely over the time now but fabrication is main spar full pre preg we built the outer clave luckily we were able to sell the outer clave um, Fabrication of the skins, wet layout, as I mentioned. All the molds were MDF. I have a long story with MDF. A lot of people say MDF doesn't work to do molds. They, they work. Just need to know which MDF you're going to buy. Uh, this is an outboard panel, 67 layers. Inboard panel, 137 layers of pre Cool. Uh, it's hard to find hangers to build a glider like that, so I saw myself working outside a lot. It's painful in Jackson, California, where it's either 105 or 30 degrees. Uh, here you can see the fabrication. Uh, we have a lot of uh, water tanks. We can carry 100 liters, 25 gallons of water. Uh, we didn't use yet. Let's see how it goes. And then you can see all the wiring. And, and this is the push rod that goes to one bell crank that drives that L around the tip. Um, as I said, I started this project independently, alone, 
with friends like Eric and Craig helping. When I broke the wing, it was a huge setback for me because I had just um, agreed to go teach at Cal Poly. So I, I joked that I was doing control out the heat on my life. So I left everything that I had in Brazil. I had a huge, a nice job there. I quit the job. I had a beautiful workshop there. I quit the workshop. I was moving my family to San Luis Obispo. I just had moved them two days before I broke the wing and the wing broke. And it was devastating. It was hard, hard, hard. But the good thing about that was now I was trying to move everything to San Luis Obispo, working on a tea hanger, but I was able to bring the students back. So I can say that on my life I built four airplanes, all of them, all of them with students. And this is really what matters to me. So here I have pictures. Yeah, cranes. That's that's what happens when you build a 53 aspect ratio wing. It's it's not home built anymore. It's it's terrible. Structural test. Uh, you can't see here, but the idea of the structural test. So I have drums of water. Each one has a certain amount of water, and they are on an inclined plane. Okay, the drum here, inclined plane, and with the chain hoist. As soon as the chain hoist starts to to bring it up, the drum rolls on the on the inclined plane, and I can I know exactly the load that's on the the chain. So you didn't vary the weight of the water in in the tank. You just varied the weight that uh, went to the wing by yeah, the inclined plane. Yeah. The good thing about this is when it broke, it didn't add more weight to the wing. The weight was the same. Of course, this wing brought it back. All the drums start to fly. Yeah. But I, I did not overload this wing. You didn't hit the trailer, did you? No, <laughs> the, the ladder hit the trailer, but not the wing. No, actually the, the day that we broke the trailer was not here. The good thing with the inclined plane is that I keep my drums where I want and this angle that I'm trying to load is really pretty close to perpendicular to the wing all the time. So yeah, it was a good setup. I would totally do another structural test like this again. Oh, and for twist, you just change the position of the hoist on the clamps, and then you twist the wing at the same time. Flight testing, cautious approach as always, and then here Jim is, is a crucial person on this process. Uh, I work with a lot of pilots around the world, different philosophies, uh, I wish all of them have Jim's philosophy, the way that he approached flight. It's amazing. Um, we did the first flight in Merced at Kessel. Um, of course, first flight is the day that the air goes below the tire. That was satisfying. Um, no major hiccups. Well, it depends on what you call a major hiccup. First flight, we have an asymmetric spoiler retraction. Um, it was interesting because on, on, on the initial briefing, the test of the spoiler war was the last thing to do. And during the briefing, we decided that we should do the first thing, really because one of the possibilities is a symmetrical deployment. And we had symmetrical, symmetrical deployment. I'm going to end up breaking this And But when he retracted, one of the push rods buckled due to the angle that the push rod was doing with the deflection of the wing. Um, I had other experiences with, um, I never had an asymmetrical deployment before, but I had re I read that, um, I, I don't remember which manual, but saying, if you have a symmetrical deployment, don't worry, just step on the rudder is enough. And if you have altitude, just open the other one. So that was a procedure that we used, and it was an easy fix. Uh, Bob Kaikendo is not here anymore, huh? Bob tomorrow. is like a... Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. tomorrow. He's a prophet. <laughs> because he came to visit me when I was starting this and he said, speed brakes will be the biggest problem. Wow. And indeed. Oh my gosh, I have so much <laughs> speed brakes. Well, the height for the speed brakes is about this. Wow. And I have four fences there. Yeah. And to collapse everything and make think the, the cap close with the wings deflecting that much. It was just difficult. So it took like three or four flights for us to make sure the caps are sealed. Uh, now they are. Um, 
We have one landing gear collapsing. Hope you guys heard about that. Uh, Jim did a perfect landing, and the landing gear just. I just remember the airplane falling on the ground. You know, it goes slow motion in your mind. And the first thing that I thought was, I'm not fixing this one. Call Rex, <laughs> and I call Rex, and Rex did. And it's a problem that is on the landing gear. The hose for the brake goes parallel to the to the to the landing gear. And there's one metal loop that the hose goes inside. But the landing gear is really close to the skin of the glider, and so I should just put a, a little notch that the hose is supposed to go in, and it didn't went in, and that prevents it to lock. And this glider, believe it or not, had no indication of gear lock. So we fixed that, and we put two indications and a detent. The Ash 30 doesn't have any detent. So we put a detent. Um, yeah, so far those are the hiccups that we have. I mean, we have more stuff like uh, farm is not working, uh, ELT is not working, stuff like that. But believe it or not, fly-by-wire is the only thing that's working. <laughs> no problem. With and when I say it works, we did have failures. Like I had one flat, one, one, one of the servers that's on the mixer was hitting the stop really hard. And the server has protection for uh, excess of torque. Mm -hmm. So that server switched off. And, and Jim land, and he never told me anything about asymmetrical flaps or anything. And I went to the data, and I saw that the computer behaved the way that we programmed. So we had the failure, but the computer fixed it. And so I'm, I'm happy with that. No, no, I'm not that crazy. No, just the flaps. That's first flight. Sorry, I'm finishing. I know that I'm late, Eric. It's really nice to see the first bending mode. The wing is all like this, and it just goes away as soon as the, the lift stiffs the wing. And we can see that on the flutter analysis really well. Release them up. Let just go quick here. Uh, can you imagine that both airplanes have the same wing area? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Nixus. Uh, Jim did uh, 570, 568 kilometers in Indian another day. Uh, we are not being really lucky with uh, weather so far. Uh, a few days ago, we flew in Paso. Morgan Hall flew it, and and he went all the way from Paso Robles to Colinga. North of Colinga. Yeah, north of Colinga, 80 kilometers out, and he had to go back to Utah and his glacier hose. Just turned the glider back, point the nose to Paso Robles, 180 kilometers per hour, and just went straight. <laughs> and at that day, we measure our average glide ratio of 46 to 1 at 180 kilometers per hour. And that's the ash study. So that gives you an idea where we can go with this. Uh, CG was pretty far forward, 34%. The, the neutral point is 60%. We're flying with the CG as, much, as forward as possible. So he had a hard time to circle because CG was too far forward. And that probably hurts this a little bit. So, and the last video that I have is just, uh, I'm gonna just move forward a little bit. Let's first take off. Jim's report and Hall, uh, uh, Morgan reports a really light element, of course, of course, which makes the whole glider way more Discussion if we had to put a force feedback system set it up. There's no such thing like light elements. It's light elements. And you can see the middle of the flight. This is the first flight. It's pretty smooth and relaxed. Of course, it's just like And I want to finish my presentation with this phrase from Joe Sutter. I've been saying this for a long time. You know, build high performance airplanes to school. I saw race airplanes flying more than 300 knots 
front of my nose that I built. It's awesome. Uh, but at the end, what matters is our story. The story of those kids and, and, and how we build this. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.